This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Erosia Shy. Hello, once again, this is Erosia Shy uh, with another episode of Musings of the Shy podcast. This episode is episode 148. What's wrong with it? We discuss Bit- what's wrong with Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XD, Bitcoin Unlimited. This episode, we are going to continue our discussion of all the downsides of these uh, different proposals uh, when it comes to the Bitcoin size uh, lock debate. Uh, this is part two of our ongoing week uh, about the downsides. Uh, um, we're going to kind of break it down and explain why these proposals were not activated versus uh, SegWit, which is seeking um, activation now, whether it be through SegWit 2x, user activated soft fork, uh, which is supposed to happen August 1st, and the Dark Horse SegWit version, which is BIP1, BIP91. Uh, which we will discuss when we discuss uh, the SegWit issue, uh, the downsides of SegWit, if you will. But before we get into all of that, the news. So South Korea is ready to legalize Bitcoin. This comes from Steemit. It's written by Sam BP. A new set of bills is reportedly being prepared to regulate and legalize cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum in South Korea. Uh, The Korea Herald reported that the representatives of Park Hyun Jin is drawing up three revisions this month to the bill of regulatory framework for digital currencies. One of the bills will be, be trading, will bring trader, traders and companies engaging in cryptocurrency transactions under the preview of the South Korean government. The other revisions address income and corporate tax laws to enable financial authorities to curb any instance of tax evasion for digital, digital currency transactions. Uh, South Korea has consistently figured among the world's largest Bitcoin trading markets this year. Uh, they're really big into Ethereum. Uh, they recently had a hack into that. And when we do an update about Ethereum, we'll talk about some of the issues that are, that are going on within that space. In particular, um, the whole ICO craze. And our next article is about Japan. The rollout of 260,000 Bitcoin accepted stores in Japan begins by Kevin Helms. It comes from Bitcoin.com. Three months after Recruit Lifestyle partnered with Japanese Bitcoin exchange CoinCheck to enable over 260,000 retail stores to accept Bitcoin, the company has finally announced on Monday that its point-of-sale app is now Bitcoin ready. Immediately, a chain of 334 eyeglass stores using the app announced that it will accept the cryptocurrency starting July 10th. Uh, Bitcoin.com reported in April about Recruit Lifestyle Company Limited partnering with Japanese Bitcoin exchange CoinCheck for its point-of-sale or POS app called Logo Payment for Air Rigi to accept Bitcoin payments. On Monday, almost three months later, Recruit Lifestyle finally announced that the Air Rigi app now offers a Bitcoin payment option starting on July 3rd. The announcement came two days after a law that removes the 8% uh, consumption tax on Bitcoin went into effect in Japan. I'm kind of skipping down here. On Monday, a chain of eyeglass stores with 334 locations across Japan also announced that all its stores will start accepting Bitcoin beginning July 10th. The chain is called uh, Megan Super, and it uses the Air Rigi app. The company expects its user base to increase, especially from Europe and the U.S., since the new form of payment will improve convenience. Uh, Kambontan reported, in addition, it believes adding the Bitcoin payment option will attract tourists to the stores, which already accept Alipay and LinePay through Air Rigi. Uh, Kagaki and Kubata and CoinCheck International Business Developer confirmed to Bitcoin.com that the eyeglass stores are the first of the 260,000 plus stores that will start accepting Bitcoin using the Energy app. In addition to working with Recruit Lifestyles, CoinCheck has also been busy signing up merchants to accept Bitcoin directly. Recent additions to the exchange list of 5,000 plus Bitcoin accepted stores include popular capsule hotels, a property management company in Aki. Akiha Bar and Kai Corporation, which owns five unique restaurants in Japan. So I imagine Japan will become a, a go-to destination for many Bitcoin enthusiasts. I knowing what I like best about this rollout is that it seems that it's seeking to be like convenient stuff. Like it could, they have a really strong convenience game in Japan. Uh, I'm trying to best explain it for my international. Viewers, if you ever see these videos about Japan about their their small stores, if you will, uh, they always have like you know their snacks and their the drinks. We, those type of small stores, uh, we call them convenience stores here in America. Uh, they have a very strong set of stores or systems out there where you can get your basics like your toothbrush, your toothpaste, 
uh, your little snacks, some dinners. They have a really strong uh, noodle or lunch and dinner game where you basically buy your, your whole meal, if you will, within these stores. Either microwave it or get it fresh right there and go. Um, it's a very big business for them. I would imagine such basic necessities like that, having that convenience, it would be a strong point for um, Bitcoin users because now they can not only do more, but do other things and do it on the cheap or do it at a convenience, if you will, as well as there's like, you know, the traditional things that you do as a tourist, if you will, like going to the nice, nice restaurants, seeing all the different uh, marquee places, uh, maybe visit some of these high-end luxury stores that are, are now accepting uh, Bitcoin just globally. Uh, now you can do this in Japan. Uh, hotels, transportation, um, just pretty much covering and hitting as much of the economic sectors as you as possible for someone who has uh, Bitcoin in mind and wants to use it as a, a payment method for just everything. So let's get into this. Uh, the downsides of the Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited, and Bitcoin XT, they share the kind of the same downsides. We talked in the previous episode about raising the block size, how it would increase um, the cost of running miners, nodes. Uh, it would be very difficult because when the miners are mining, they're not going to know about um, offering blocks. It would increase that. Um, at the same time, you're not, there's going to be a drop in nodes because there's going to be so much uh, memory usage. Not everyone has the, the bandwidth necessary to run the node. Broadband is not everywhere. It's not universal. There's also data data cap, uh, caps and things of that nature. So you have that you know economic uh, pressure place on the network where the cost is going to be very prohibitive and it could increase centralization and as a result of a, a network that um, is intended to be decentralized it will have these additional attack vectors um, associated with it and so that's one of the negatives of the, the Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XT and Bitcoin Unlimited was that the proposals had this component. The second one was the hard fork where it is a strong, 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 strong chance of a chain splitting as a result, you could end up having either two completely different Bitcoins or for a brief period of time, um, a lot of miners or people will be operating on one um, Bitcoin network that could be um, wiped out or have replay attacks or doesn't have the, the back end, the economic um, full weight of the network and a shorter change and then people will drop it and whatever transactions that may have occurred on there are will cease to exist. And this... In, and also the actual splitting the network, which we'll talk about in the doomsday uh, scenario, will cause a dip in the integrity of Bitcoin in itself as something that's immutable, as something that's safe, as a, a different type of system than the already existing financial sectors that are out there. And it would uh, cause a big stink or a bad reputation associated with Bitcoin in and itself. People may be less inclined to invest or put any their economic uh, know-how, knowledge, and monetary effort into this system. So let's talk about some of the little key differences between the Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin Core, and why these four disagreements kind of are leading to um, some of the negatives, if you will, with uh, these different proposals. And I'm using Bitcoin Classic here to substitute for the, all three of these proposals because they share some of the same stuff. Uh, there will be a difference in the sense that when we talk about emerging consensus, which is what Bitcoin Unlimited is based off of, uh, that has its own very much different downsides, if you will. So one, balancing the decentralization and efficiency. So this comes from Bitcoin Magazine. It was written by Kyle Torbury. It was written last year. So Bitcoin Core contributor Peter Todd was recently interviewed on episode 34 of the Bitcoin Game, and a longtime Bitcoin developer and researcher was able to explain some of the key disagreements between how the Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin Core teams view the peer-to-peer -peer digital cash system. While many view the Classic versus Core controversy as nothing more than a technical play debate, the reality is both camps seem to have a rather different fundamental plans for the future of Bitcoin. During his recent interview, Todd noted, I think you have a, you've got a group of developers with a very different view of how Bitcoin works, and that's the goal of their projects are. I think in the inevitability going to lead to a lot of friction. The current climate in the Bitcoin community is extremely contentious and the different philosophy views in the classic and core camps 
or at the root of all the controversy. When asked directly about the key difference between Bitcoin Core and Classic's alternative implementation, Tad was able to provide four specific examples of why the two sides do not see eye to eye. Balancing de decentralization and efficiency. For most of the crux of the Classic versus Core debate in decentralization versus efficiency, the Classic team is more willing to increase the system resource requirements for operating a full node, while the Core team wants to keep the barriers to running a full node as low as possible. Uh, during Todd's interview, he often used Bitcoin Classic builder Gavin Andreessen as an example of someone who opposes Core's main viewpoints. Gavin expects people to go make the trade-off where in exchange for having a system that's cheaper, you have a system that's more centralized. Todd also pointed out that Andreessen has claimed early adopters may be upset with what Bitcoin eventually becomes. It should be known that many on the Classic side of the debate would say that their view on how Bitcoin should work would actually be better for decentralization over the long term, so this gets into the new area of contention between the two sides, keeping Bitcoin's base layer decentralized. So again, the cost of this, in the sense of, again, we talked about uh, finding, on finding your own Satoshi about how people view Bitcoin. Is it a settlement layer or is it digital cash? Or a third component that people don't often talk about is it can be both. But that's one of the, you know, the negatives of the consensus of the, between the miners and the users, whichever block they choose to be, with the minimum requirement being uh, one megabyte of, of one version or two megabytes and going as high as eight megabytes to whatever the network, economic network, chooses to be. The problem with that is that it's just too wishy washy. You, it's not too consistent. You have, you know, one day or once a series of blocks is one megabyte and then you go all the way to four megabytes and then you drop down to three megabytes and then you go all the way up to eight megabytes. It's There's not enough uh, software, hardware, information currently in existence right now that would allow for such a flexibility with that type of a, a system. And that's one. So let's continue our discussion of the downsides of these agreements. Uh, let's talk about extension blocks which is part of Bitcoin Unlimited, which is something that uh, Purse.io is a part of. Uh, you have the whole Bitcoin, which is a node download that has an option of uh, accepting or allowing for decision blocks to occur. But let's talk about the downsides of utilizing that concept of extension blocks. So as you know, uh, this is from Matt Corolla. This is from the uh, uh, Bitcoin dev list. Um, there will be a link to the show notes to just like everything else um, here. So he says, hey Johnson, as you know, I've always been a large critic of this approach. So it's a continuation of that extension block software proposal with the previous message. Uh, the next message deals with um, anti-transaction replay and a hard fork. So this is uh, Matt Corolla's message, which he posted Saturday, January 28th of this year. First, a bit of background. Uh, Peter, I think he's talking about Peter Wills, excellent post on the security of soft work. One covers pretty pretty well why soft works are preferable to hard works by debunking much of the soft works are less secure arguments. Again, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XT, and Bitcoin Unlimited are hard works. As well as um, kind of mentioned at the top here about the Bitcoin ABC is going to be a hard fork, but we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, doomsday scenarios there. While those arguments apply readily to your proposal, what wasn't covered are the soft forks are corrosive arguments. Indeed, many of those arguments are also bogus. After all, soft forks are not forks without buy-in from the economically relevant community running nodes, which enforce the new rules, i.e. fork by minor censorship, isn't all that much of a fork at all and has security properties which I would be hesitant to use for anything but the smallest of value. That said, when we start talking about extension blocks, I believe we start to rapidly enter this corrosive territory. With SegWit, we've seen pretty clearly that the community, much to its detriment, can be easily made unwilling to speak up for or against a fork, making consensus an incredibly murky thing. Lucky, as noted in Peter's original post, there isn't much harm in a passive observer not making their voice heard and going along with enforcing SegWit. SegWit maintains the UTXO compatibility and transactions continue as normal, only hiding information, information necessary to apply the software rules from all nodes. This is not significantly different from any of the soft work where declining to enforce its rules results in missing information. Only in this case, in the form of additional va validity rules instead of signature signatures themselves, which otherwise you don't know what to do with. Even better, the bandwidth increase for fully 
hopefully validated nodes have been more than offset by other technology upgrades. Much of this goes out with the window with extension blocks. Instead of the extra data being reasonable to ignore, if you choose not to enforce the software rules, all of a sudden a majority, or at least a significant chunk of the transaction on the network are happening in the data you've chosen to ignore. Instead of being able to reasonably walk back transaction histories to identify risks based on potential uh, censorship enforced transaction, i.e. transactions in a software where you're not aware of, potentially that only miners are enforcing, all transactions will look risky. Instead of being able to force fundamental network rules like the 21 million uh, coin limit, we're left to trust that what is happening on the extension block, which all miners are largely forced to mining due to the revenue opportunity costs, this only makes it a social cost, not an individual trust problem. Instead of opting into a soft work security or lack thereof for your own transaction, the entire network is forced to trust the extension block. Finally, this sets up for some pretty terrible precedent. As we noted in the footnotes of the original sidechain paper, the idea that miners will start soft working in sidechains is a massive bricks. It allows individual large miners and individual economic users to force others to switch to new consensus rules with potentially little con consensus or review. So again, the downside here is with these extension blocks and the data being in a different place you, and you, everyone is not really sure what's going on there except for the miners, then you can have some shenanigans happening. You can have potentially uh, a soft fork or even a hard fork occurring within the extension blocks and it's going to force people to jump through these hoops and maybe not necessarily want to do so. And that's not really why people are here. Uh, no one trusts everyone, but if we all agree to the same set of rules and have an understanding of the rules, then we get these kind of consensus. And it's the way Bitcoin is designed, and we'll talk about that, um, about consensus. Um, again, you know, the downside of consensus is that it's difficult to change. It's, you're supposed to make these changes kind of gradual. You're supposed to be consistent with the change, but it's supposed to be not so uh, detrimental, if you will supposed to be something that is beneficial for all and not just a subset of people uh, whatever changes that do occur again you have to have a very high threshold of agreement and this is why we're having this contentious debate with within the bitcoin community about scaling about you know whether these different proposals are outside the scope of bitcoin core which we talked about at the top here uh, is one of the negatives that is not coming from the bitcoin core devs uh, that the code in it itself is not as solid as those created by the Bitcoin core. So this is why another reason why these uh, particular proposals weren't um, accepted. And it's these, these uh, changes of the consensus rules, uh, changes of the shape of the network, if you will, with the uh, extension blocks or dynamic blocks or raising the block in itself uh, raises the economic costs. But at the same time, it changes the way people are able to see everything going on within the network, particularly with extension blocks, and people don't want that. They they're not they want to see everything going on within the blockchain. They want to know everything is valid, everything's going through. There's no double spending. There's no uh, shenanigans, if you will. So that's a little bit more about extension blocks and why they are not the best. Then we have uh, you know Bitcoin Classic here. So the downside of Bitcoin Classic. As a reminder, it's a hard fork. Uh, this comes from a post from uh, Reddit uh, by Johnny1000. As a reminder, Bitcoin Classic was a contentious hard fork proposal for two megabyte block blocks with particularly dangerous activation mythology, which was, was what many of the community opposed it. Char characteristics of Bitcoin Classic activation is false. 75% rolling minor vote voting. In contrast to voting window like SegWit, for example, there was a 75% rolling voting for the hard fork proposal. This guarantees at the time of the hard fork activation, exactly 25% of the miners would not have to upgrade. This therefore ensures that there are two chains and two coins. The rolling voting excludes even the possibility of allowing all the miners to upgrade to prevent a chain split. So there could be, you know, there was no guarantee that there's not gonna be a chain split. Uh, the threshold or consistency was too low. The two week grace period or correction 28 days, the grace period before the hard fork and blocks over one megabyte being produced was just two weeks, an incredibly short period of time, meaning it was very likely that many users would not have upgraded. So it's too short of a window for everyone globally to upgrade. And no checkpoint. There are no checkpoints for the hard fork chain. As an illustrated example, Bitcoin Classic would have had a rule which stated that the first block after act activation must be over one megabyte, but it didn't have such a rule. Instead, if speculators decided to invest in the original chain and drive the price up, 
Miners will have to switch to it. Then it becomes the most work chain. Bitcoin Classic notes we regard the original rules chains of Bitcoin. The transaction history of Bitcoin Classic would have been discarded. So you will have this kind of a attack vector, if you will, that would uh, cause the Bitcoin Classic chain fork to not be economically viable, if you will. Uh, the combination of these factors combined with a small minority of people who are happy who are unhappy with the two mega block blocks at the time, mostly due to the lack of fixes for quadratic hashing, made this hard fork proposal extremely dangerous. In my view, a total wipeout was extremely likely and almost certain. This would have resulted in a loss of funds for many users and significant damage to the integrity of the ecosystem. Bitcoin is very lucky that the core developer teams decided not to merge such code and that many users are smart enough not to run Bitcoin Classic. I hope that as a community we are humble enough to acknowledge that the future upgrade proposals can be done in a much more robust way than the Bitcoin Classic. Then we can be hopeful and end this contention and collaborate, develop, and test safer, more responsible ways of upgrading the network rules. So again, the downside is um, there was going to be a split. The window, it was very uh, short. It required a lower threshold of 75%. Uh, at the same time, this, the classic proposal also didn't come from the Bitcoin Core, which is why they never integrated any type of BIPs that would have been associated with Bitcoin Classic when it first proposed. Um, they didn't activate them. It didn't meet their high standards. And so that's why Bitcoin Classic in itself was never accepted by a majority of people. They didn't get the, you know, the Bitcoin Core approval. There was these flaws. Uh, again, the whole two megabyte in itself, raising the block size with the whole miners and the nodes. There was an economic cost to that. But at the same time, the whole splitting mechanism wasn't very clear and people people don't want two chains now there are some people who ad, ad, advocate for two chains and say you know let people go where they want to go let you know let the cards fall as they may if you will um, and there are those who say if you want to split the chain why don't you just go ahead and just create your own coin if you will instead of breaking bitcoin in two or breaking it all together so there is a downside to bitcoin classic and you can apply the same rules with Bitcoin XT in this regard as well. You know, it had a low, a very extremely low, low threshold to activation. Uh, the code really wasn't as many consider it to be up to snuff, if you will, at the same high caliber, high ca caliber grade as Bitcoin Core. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that Bitcoin Core has more devs on it. Um, the mailing list and the testing phases are much longer periods of time. There's more eyeballs on the code, so more people are looking at it testing it, checking it, adding to it, making corrections, um, writing papers or counter code, or, or it's, it's constantly being looked upon, moved upon, worked, mixed. All sorts of things are happening before anything were ever to be actually activated. And because it's open source, because people are able to see all this going on, then you're not having um, issues that were happening with Bitcoin Classic, even Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin XT. Uh, there's not enough people working and not only that but uh, the quality of development if you will the, the people that are writing the code uh, while they might be great on their own or by themselves uh, being able to work on a system that's all these billions billions of dollars of money and monetary value uh, people are human people are going to make mistakes they're not going to see every angle uh, they're not going to see every type of solution and bugs are going to be abound uh, this is what happened with bitcoin unlimited which we're going to talk about in a second where all sorts of different types of bugs occurred and for something that's economically vi valuable and viable as bitcoin is you can't have type of bugs that would cause a crash in the marketplace cause people to lose their money cause wipeouts or things of that nature now while bitcoin unlimited shares the same problems that bitcoin xt bitcoin classic has it has this different thing where emerging consensus was considered a gamble and so I want to read um, an article by Aaron Van Weerdum, which was published February 1st, and it's Why Bitcoin Unlimited's Emerging Consensus is a Gamble. So this is a, one of the downsides of if you were to activate Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, one of the Bitcoin Core software, software forks introduced in late 2015, garnered much attention in recent months. The project gained hashing power support from several new Bitcoin mining pools, including uh, BIBTC, GB miners and BTC.top, while node adoption appeared to be on the rise as well. 
The central idea behind Bitcoin Unlimited is specified in the Bitcoin Unlimited Improvements Proposals uh, 001 or BERP 001 is to hand control of Bitcoin's block size limit to users and miners, or perhaps more accurately, to make this control more explicit and easier to handle. So again, it's changing the consensus role structure. But as it's explained in how, uh, in uh, BERP uh, 001, it does not include a technical consensus mechanism as reliable as in Bitcoin's current consensus role. Instead, Bitcoin Unlimited relies on the philosophy often referred to as emergent consensus. Um, and then it has something in parentheses here. Note, if you're not sure how Bitcoin Unlimited works or what the technical weaknesses of BERP 001 are, make sure to read, first read a closer look at Bitcoin Unlimited's configured block size proposal and how Bitcoin Unlimited users may end up on a different blockchain. So they can talk about forking over there. Uh, we'll read part of the, the closer look um, after this. So, but we're going to talk about emerging consensus. So BERP 0101 does not ensure machine consensus. Users can configure their nodes to split into different blockchains, either intentionally or unintentionally. Instead, Bitcoin Unlimited relies on emerging consensus. This is a conviction that participants in the Bitcoin ecosystem have a strong enough economic incentive to converge on a single blockchain, such that they will converge on a single blockchain. If their software does not automatically realize this, users are expected to configure their settings to make it happen. After all, it benefits everyone to be the, on the same blockchain and be able to transact with one another. So again, instead of it, the software automatically pushing people onto <coughs> the blockchain, it requires that the users be active participants in doing the coding and the changing or the upgrading, if you will, and being right there on that. And when you have a society where it's very difficult to update anything, this is, again, a negative. How this emerging consensus should form is not really documented, however. While some have made analogies with flocks of birds, for example, it's not clear how those these apply to Bitcoin exactly. That said, it's possible to draw a scenario that many Bitcoin Unlimited proponents roughly envision. At first step, users should signal what size of blocks they will accept with the excessive block size EV setting, and then miners' incentives to satisfy market demand should increase or decrease the block size limit accordingly. Finally, if these new blocks exceed some users' EV, these users are expected to follow regardless, either because the excessive acceptance step setting is triggered or maybe because they reconfigure their nodes manually. As examples in uh, Bitcoin Unlimited users may, have a, may end up on a different blockchain, this scenario doesn't present some problems. One, if users' EV signal is trivially spoofed by an adversary, miners can be tricked into thinking the block size limit increase has more support than it does, or perhaps malicious miners can themselves trick users. And for the remaining users, this scenario presents an odd choice. Either they set their AD settings low to remain in consensus, but essentially give up much of their autonomy to miners, or they set their AD settings high to protect their anonymity but risk splitting the network. So there's no chain splitting um, protection that could be occurring on like an hourly, minutely, or daily basis, if you will. On-chain coordination. To counter some of the problems described, emerging consensus can also be established through debate on forums, blog posts, chat rooms, and other media. Realistically, it may even require the kind of off-chain coordination to some extent. For example, a mining pool via BTC wants to hard fork to, to a 2 megabyte size limit. That's not what the pool is currently signaling. However, this kind of off-chain coordination is not unique. Groups of people have been coordinating and achieved consensus through discourse for a long time. But such systems either, often either have a leader or tend to break down and split into factions once the number of participants reach a certain size. Other popular open source projects, for example, sometimes consist of hundreds of incomplete forks. And this is probably more true under adversarial conditions. If the people in these groups don't really know or trust one another, they have no way of knowing whether the other people are telling the truth or lying. Even a single adversary can pretend to be many users to communicate many false prefaces. This makes coordination and reaching consensus a very difficult problem to solve. In fact, this is the Byzantine general's problem. This is exactly the problem Satoshi Nakamoto is to address. For the track record of about eight years, Bitcoin's main technological team achievement is a math-based protocol that realizes strong, fast, scalable, and automatic machine consensus for a large group of people who do not necessarily know or trust one another. Bitcoin is reasonable, Byzantine fault is tolerant. Bitcoin Unlimited proponents believe that Bitcoin's economic incentives and incentives for users are to all remain part of the same Bitcoin blockchain is in itself sufficient to seem fault, Byzantine fault tolerant. But that is so far largely unproven. No all coin relies on similar assumptions, nor is there a publicly available test net, test net where 
the burp uh, 001 configuration are actively used. So here we go, emerging consistency is a downside here. Um, <coughs> what Bitcoin Unlimited changes, we kind of continue further. That said, part of the same Bitcoin Unlimited philosophy is that Bitcoin relies on the sort of emerging consensus anyway. Rather than merely relying on math, code, or protocol, many really see Bitcoin as a consensus between people first and foremost. People choose to partake in the system, people give it value, and sometimes like during the August 2010 and March uh, 2013 blockchain forks, people have to coordinate off-chain to determine which chain is valid. As such, uh, Burp001 doesn't fundamentally change anything. Users choose to run Bitcoin Unlimited. No software can already be uh, recompiled, and a social consensus may have to form off-chain either way. But by making this control more explicit and easier to handle, and assuming users actually use these options, Bitcoin Unlimited does rely on the human consistent aspect, aspect to, to a much larger extent. Rather than opting into a protocol once and relying on machine consensus from then on, users need to take on a more proactive role. As one Bitcoin Unlimited proponent noted, shortly after miners had to reconfigure their nodes in response to a bug that briefly forked the network earlier this week, this is part of how Bitcoin works. It's not meant for people sleeping at the wheel. And given that Bitcoin in general is 24-7, you are not going to have a 24-7 hour, 24-7 watch. No individual can do that, no group of people, are they going to split one hour on, one hour off, four hours on, it's, there is a human aspect of this that there, there's limitations to it, if you will. It's true that BERT doesn't introduce, uh, that wasn't possible before, as an open source project, users and miners can always recompile their Bitcoin software to do anything that Bitcoin Unlimited allows. But of course, this in itself is not an argument in favor of Burp 001. Just because users could does not mean they should. So far, Bitcoin has a, had several forks that lasted for several blocks caused by technical failures. The August 2010 blockchain fork was needed to revert the creation of billions of Bitcoins out of thin air, which required offering an hour-long chain. The only reason that event wasn't catastrophic is that Bitcoin was hardly used as money back then. During the March uh, 2013 blockchain fork, however, the network was unreliable for users. At least one person was double spent, while several miners wasted valuable resource mining an orphan chain. The same is true for the July 2015 blockchain fork, where miners were urged to switch to fully validating mining pools, and many have learned from that mistake. Indeed, developers, miners, and the rest of the Bitcoin community have generally tried to avoid these types of crisis events as much as they possibly can. In contrast, Bitcoin Unlimited seems to embrace them as an upgrade mechanism. Um, <clears throat> So here's some notes here as well. Johnny1000 contributed to this article. Author notes that earlier version of the article suggests there's no testnet for burp 001 at all. Since publication, it was pointed out that there actually is such a testnet dubbed uh, Nullnet. This testnet is not really publicly available, however, and seems to be used only by a small group of developers close to the Bitcoin Unlimited project. And of course, by definition, a testnet does not test economic senses either way, so these remain unproven. And then uh, here's a critique, this is about four months ago, by Charlie Lee when he was at Coinbase. Uh, he since has left Coinbase to uh, run uh, Litecoin full-time, or at least participate in the running of Litecoin full-time. So this is from his Twitter account, and it has to do with um, Bitcoin Unlimited devs try to defend emerging consensus idea, but end up invalidating it instead. So here was his tweet, so Oliver Jansen's... Uh, what if Andrew Stone, today Charlie posts a series of tweets dealing some concerns he has with Bitcoin and Lumen being adopted in exchanges. So here's uh, some of the response here. So, so Andrew uh, Stone, who's one of the developers of Bitcoin Unlimited, and here's what Charlie Lee's criticisms, if you will, about emerging consensus. So Andrew is proposing that all users exchanges and wallets and merchants do an on-the-fly, uncoordinated, user-activated hard fork. If that's not reckless, I don't know what is. It's also antithesis of emerging consensus, where you have to dictate which block is invalid instead of letting consensus emerge. Please take more than a few hours to think about my concerns, and exchange and operators should come up with a better solution. For BU's sake, I already explained why, as an exchange, we cannot run BU's code as is. Figure out a safer way to activate the hard fork, and let's chat about it later. And FYI, is okay for the hard fork away from core to not utilize emerging consensus. Emerging consensus could work after the hard fork, but it definitely doesn't work as an initial hard fork. Climb a flag date hard fork to 2 megabytes with replay protection or some other plan that's not hand wavy. Then exchanges can support BU safely. So again, what it boils down to is with the Bitcoin 
classic Bitcoin XT and Bitcoin Unlimited. There is an issue of what you can say is uh, sloppy coding, if you will, or everything is not fully thought up and fully developed to where people are going to trust utilizing this code. And one of the contentions of Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Unlimited, whether it be from the devs that were participating in creating these proposals, or their supporters are, is that Bitcoin Core um, shouldn't have the monopoly on the development of Bitcoin in and of itself. And I can kind of somewhat understand it and, and agree to one point in the sense that it should be, um, if you can get consensus, you can put whatever proposals out there, but you you have to get consensus from the network, from all players and parties. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to go through Bitcoin Core. Uh, it can be completely decentralized where anyone can make uh, a proposal. But at the same time, in a sense, Bitcoin Core is decentralized, you know, the GitHub, anyone can make proposals and go through the process of development and testing and things of that nature to get their BIPs approved. It's just, and I understand why it's slow or very arduous. You want to make sure the code is correct and right, and you're not just putting um, spaghetti on the wall, if you will, to see if it actually works, but actually using a time method and taking your time and, and making sure your noodles you know, boil correctly, if you will. But perhaps there could be a better mechanism in this um, something that we can learn with the whole you know, these next three weeks with the whole uh, segwit attempt to segwit activation when we say it 2x user activated software and the rise of this um, VIP 91 dark horse proposal that miners are signaling and if it gets locked in then you know user active, activated software won't happen segwit will be locked in and goes to a tested period and we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, the downsides of both the this SegWit 2x um, uh, Bit 148 and a little bit about Bit 141 and Bit 91, if you will. But in general, one of the fundamental reasons why these proposals just didn't connect was the risk risk factor, the risk reward factor. The risk was just too high for whatever rewards it gains. There's a strong, 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 strong fear of chain splitting. And we'll talk about chain splitting when we talk about we get into the doomsday scenarios, if you will. Um, I think the chain splitting is overblown. I do think personally, I'll you know I'm gonna say my my thoughts for my personal thoughts on the doomsday day scenario there. But there's a strong high probability of a chain split with these proposals versus just the soft work activation of SegWit, which changes the parameters of the, the blocks where the information is done differently, where you can put more transaction in, and there, thus far can get um, more transactions in the block, the fees will get lower, uh, the miners in them itself will, are not going to have to upgrade their hardware or anything like that, it's a software deal, not everyone has to upgrade their nodes, or even the miners don't have to upgrade their nodes, um, their nodes or their, their mining equipment, and continue as is. Um, but those who do mine and, and recognize uh, the SegWit blocks are going to be able to see everything, if you will, and it's not going to cause a split in the chain. So I think that we pretty much summed up the downside of these three proposals here. Um, our next episode is going to deal with uh, user active, activated software SegWit, and then uh, we're going to talk about the downsides of certain aspects of the Bitcoin consensus that some people consider to be downsides, just the way. Bitcoin seeks consensus, if you will. And then we're going to try to wrap things up. Uh, it really depends on, <laughs> again, their, you know, changing, the changing nature of the Bitcoin community, especially with um, starting this week, uh, you know, this whole BIP91 and Bitcoin ABC thing popped up. Uh, it really depends on that, if you will. So that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.